this pressure on your ears during landing approach. I don't know if it's always that way. Perhaps it happens to people who don't fly so often and are not used to it. It is certainly also an effect of the descent. That is the actual cause. The landing approach itself is not responsible for it, but the descent. What we pilots call the landing approach really doesn't start until the last 3,000 feet. Everything before that is part of the descent when the aircraft leaves its cruising altitude and enters a so-called transition. I shouldn't go into too many details because it could get quite technical, but high up in the air you have much less pressure than lower down, and the change in pressure is not the same for every flight level. During descent you pass through many different altitudes, although the pressure difference is smaller. The larger pressure difference doesn't come until you approach the ground, during the last 10,000 feet, and that is when your rears have the greatest pressure change to equalize. The use station tubes are responsible for this. We know some tricks for those who are really bothered by it. Drink something in order to swallow, or take chewing gum, or do as divers do, use your nose to equalize the pressure. Can you really see shooting stars better up there at night? Yes, indeed, because there is less scattered light, and particularly when there is less illumination down on the ground, like when you're flying over the ocean and the night is very dark, you naturally get a much better view of shooting stars. Why do pilots' announcements always sound so unclear? I think that's because we set the microphone for optimal communication with air traffic control. If we switch over to our own channel to speak to the passengers back in the cabin, then the volume is often quite low. We would have to speak more loudly. But if you overdo it, the people feel like you're shouting at them. You always try to find a happy compromise. We do ask our stewardesses to tell us if we're speaking too loudly or too softly. And if so, we can repeat the announcement, hopefully coming across more comfortably for the passengers. When do you have three people in the cockpit and when only two? I don't know whether this question refers to the old days when we still had a flight engineer. Then you were only permitted to fly an aircraft if you had three people on board. Today this is no longer the case. Now we only need two. A pilot may even leave his seat briefly under certain circumstances, but not during takeoff and landing, of course. Only during cruise flight. If it is a very, very long flight, then the third person might come into play on the basis of a kind of rotation principle, but only two people are ever really busy operating the aircraft, no matter how long the flight is and what distance the aircraft is covering. But as an added measure to make it possible for one to take a break, there is sometimes a third man, the so-called SFO, the senior first officer. He can take over for the captain or the FO, the first officer, otherwise known as the co-pilot during cruise flight. The captain and the first officer can't substitute for each other because they each have clearly assigned tasks. That's probably what was implied by the necessity for the third person. It's actually only for very long flights to give both the captain and the first officer a chance to take a break. How is fuel reserve calculated in terms of percentage or flight time? And how great a reserve is specified? I'll start with the last question. There is no specified amount of fuel reserve. It's part of individual flight planning. I usually only need to have an alternative airfield which I can head for if I'm unable to land at my destination. For so-called remote areas with very, very few airfields, there are exceptions in regard to which airfield I should approach if I have no alternative, but that is extremely rare. You only get this in places like the depths of Siberia. On normal route networks, we have to make a very precise fuel calculation for every route. 
eine sehr akkurate Spritberechnung machen müssen für jede Strecke. Das gilt für Hannover, München genauso wie für Hannover, Such as Hannover Munich or Und, uh, Hannover Teneriffa. Now comes the second part of the question. Reference was made to both percentages and absolute reserves. You use up a certain amount of fuel along the route, the so-called trip fuel, and for that you need an excess of at least 3% to cover any uncertainties you might encounter along the route. The second parameter, the absolute amount of reserve fuel required for flying to Tenerife or Munich, has to do with the alternative airport I must fly to in the event that I'm unable to reach my destination airport. I need enough fuel for an extra 30 minutes of flight time to reach the alternative airfield. The fuel that I need when taking off in Hanover is calculated on this basis.